So good evening and ani, welcome. My name is Tom Mickelson. I'm the President and Scientific Director of the Ontario Brain Institute, or OBI. And uh, first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered on the ancestral and traditional lands of several First Nations, most recently the Mississauga of New Credit. The gathering place, known as the Dish with One Spoon Territory, is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this territory. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of the elders in the audience who have joined us this evening as well. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for what looks to be a great set of talks. So the Ontario Brain Institute is a provincially funded organization, and we try to make science matter. We work with researchers, clinicians, industry, and patients to ensure that the excellence that we have in the Ontario neuroscience community, it's translated into real-world impact. Part of our role involves public outreach, providing opportunities to learn about the brain, its disorders, and the transformative work that's underway in Ontario. So tonight's talk focuses on Indigenous mental wellness. A lot of attention has been given in the mainstream media to Indigenous individuals and communities that are struggling with mental wellness. But there is a counter-narrative that needs to be told. And so tonight, we're going to learn the historical backdrop to some of these issues. But just as importantly, we're going to learn about Indigenous perspectives on mental wellness, which will undoubtedly enrich our own understanding. So to set up tonight's talk, I want to just have a few brief remarks to talk about three important concepts. One is that context matters, second that experiences matter, and that your presence matters. So with regards to context, tonight's talk will set a historical context to begin with. We'll learn about the colonization of North America, decades of failed policies that rather than improving relationships, lives, and the well-being of Canada's First Nations people, led to what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has recognized as a cultural genocide or destruction of those structures and practices that allow the group to continue as a group. We'll learn about the impact of these policies and actions on the mental wellness of First Nations peoples, the indomitable spirit of their, the Indigenous people, and hear examples of how communities are moving forward to ensure that mental wellness of current and future generations. I hope that the context of tonight's talk will be one of learning, openness, thoughtfulness, and I encourage everyone here to think about how each of us can participate in act of, to quote Dr. Carolyn Tate, micro-reconciliation. The second concept is that experience matters. Our brain is an exquisitely sensitive organ. It takes our world experience and creates all of our behaviors. It can flourish and grow with the love and it can shrink and grow with ill and uh, with neglect and malice. So not only do experiences matter to us in our lives, but they matter to our children and their children and their children. These experiences and their impacts on our brain and bodies are passed down. There is a scientific explanation for this by which the DNA in our uh, cells can be expressed differently in subsequent generations through a process called epigenetics. And this is how experience across generations can influence the way the DNA is read and how behavior uh, can be uh, expressed. So this evidence of epigenetics can be seen in the intergenerational trauma and cast little doubt in the fact that experience matters, not just to us, but also future generations. So finally, your presence here tonight matters. Commitments to learning matters. The purpose of OBI's series of public talks is to shed light on complex issues for anyone interested, to fight stigma with knowledge, to stimulate our brains and challenge ourselves to continue learning. A video of the talk is going to be made available. We encourage you to share it with others and stay tuned for future OBI events and talks by subscribing to our website as listed above. We're proud to be partners with TV Ontario in our public talk series, and tonight's talk is being live streamed on tvo.org. There's also uh, ability to uh, message us. I'll introduce our speakers in a moment, but uh, we'll be uh, taking uh, tweets at this, uh, these hashtags so that we will, at the end of the evening, be able to engage with the audience. I'll introduce tonight's speakers first, and then our moderator, and then ask Elder Dorothy Peters to provide a traditional opening for tonight's talk. And after our speakers have finished, there'll be this moderated Q&A session, and during the talks, you can forward your questions by tweeting. And after the Q&A, Elder Peters will come and close off with a traditional closing ceremony as well. Our speakers tonight are Dr. Michael Dan, 
a committed philanthropist and a model of social responsibility and generosity. Dedicated to Canada's Aboriginal communities, created opportunities for future generations by supporting businesses on reserves. Recently, he's also endowed the Wakabanis Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health at the University of Toronto. The first privately endowed research institute in the world geared to the unique health needs of the Aboriginal people. Michael is president of Gemini Power Corporation and a recovering neurosurgeon. <laughs> Dr. Suzanne Stewart is a member of the Yellowknife Dene First Nation and a registered psychologist. She's director of the Wakibanis Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health, an associate professor in social and behavioral health sciences division at the Dalalana School at U of T, where she holds a Canada Research Chair in Aboriginal Homelessness and Life Transitions. Dr. Stewart's research and teaching interests include Indigenous mental health and healing in psychology and Indigenous ethics and research methodology. She's also chair of the Aboriginal section of the Canadian Psychology Association and is committed to advancing Indigenous healing issues through the disciplines of health and psychology. Dr. Carol Hopkins will follow. She's the executive director of the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization committed to working with First Nations and Inuit to further the capacity of uh, communities to address specifically substance abuse and addiction through holistic approaches to healing that value culture, respect, community, and compassion. Carol has spent more than 20 years in the field of First Nations addictions and mental health. She holds both a Master's of Social Work degree from the U of T and a degree in Sacred Indigenous Knowledge equivalent of a PhD in the Western tradition. She also holds a seasonal faculty position at the School of Social Work at King's College at Western. Our moderator tonight is uh, Andre Picard. He's an award-winning health journalist who's been with the Globe and Mail for over 20 years. He's a best-selling author, renowned speaker, and an advocate for improving the health of Canadians. He's widely considered the top health journalist in the country. His approach to researching, documenting, and sharing health issues through the eyes of patients, healthcare workers, caregivers, and other individuals gives an everyday insight to daily challenges. Mr. Picard has received numerous awards and was also named Canada's first public health hero by the Canadian Public Health Association and a champion of mental health by the Canadian Alliance on Mental Illness and Mental Health. Our elder this evening is uh, Dorothy Peters, an active member of her community who speaks her language Ojibwe and teaches a language class at George Brown College uh, here in Toronto. She participates in ceremonies, fasting, sweats, and conducts the Ancestors' Feast. She's recently joined the Aboriginal Legal Services, where she's a council member for the Gwadnanang Council and participates in the circles for the dreams from growing children. She works with families that are involved with child welfare or going through the justice system. Dorothy worked with the women and children of the Native Women's Resource Center in various circles and ceremonies. She's honored to be part of the supportive environment for her community members. So I'd like to ask her to come to lead us with tonight's opening ceremony. Thank you. I have the, um, the uh, Herculean task of trying to cover 500 years of colonial history in about 20 minutes. So <laughs> without any further ado, um, oh, I want, to, I want to dedicate my talk to, to uh, a very dear friend who died a few months short of his 60th birthday who taught me um, much about indigenous history through through his gentleness and his uh, experiences, uh, Calvin Ottertail. Um, I'm going to go back in time to just before contact and then slowly work towards the present. So, um, Turtle Island, that's the name for uh, North America, in, in 1491, these numbers can be debated, but we think there were conservatively between 50 and 100 million people uh, living here. And the, the main population center was not the East Coast, uh, you know, New York, Boston area, but it was actually Central America. And um, the indigenous population of what would later be known as Canada, um, of course it wasn't known as Canada back then, but it was about 2 million people. So just remember that number, because today we have uh, probably close to 1.5 million indigenous Canadian, so almost back up to the original number. And all of these societies were self-governing and um, economically self-sufficient, and they didn't ask to be quote-unquote discovered or colonized. Uh, they were doing just fine by themselves, and some were extremely sophisticated. 
Uh, and one example are the Haudenosaunee. They're also known as the Iroquois Confederacy. And uh, their form of government was um, acknowledged in 1988 by the United States Congress as having played an inspirational role uh, in the U.S. Constitution, just to give you an idea of how sophisticated. So you had one culture borrowing from indigenous people. And um, also uh, Haudenosaunee women, um, some of the people here know how powerful they are from direct experience. Um, Haudenosaunee women had the vote 500 years before European women uh, ever did. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot. And in, in 1521, when the Spanish arrived in the city uh, known as Tenochtitlan, which now we call Mexico City, they were literally amazed by what they saw. It was an urban space that might have been the most populous urban space in the world at the time. I've heard estimates up to 200,000 people living there. Um, there were canals interconnecting buildings, and it, it was um, sort of captured in this, in this painting. Um, and um, unfortunately, about two months after first contact with, with the Spanish, just about everyone in this picture would have been dead from smallpox. So what happened uh, when, when the continents met for the first time in, in 65 million years was an exchange of uh, everything from viruses to megafauna, megafauna meaning you know, horses, for example. Horses were not in uh, Turtle Island for 10,000 years, and they were reintroduced by the Spanish. And, and the balance, unfortunately, in, in was not in favor of, of the infectious diseases. So um, smallpox, influenza, typhus, measles, malaria, they even think the common cold uh, was first introduced here in, in um, Turtle Island from, from Europe. People here didn't even have colds. Um, a lot of the foods that we associate with, with Europe, uh, so the Swiss and their chocolate, uh, Italians and the tomato sauce, um, and in India, for example, I mean like the original India, uh, and their hot spicy peppers, all of that came from here. Um, by 1710, you had a, a relationship between the indigenous people and the Europeans that we would call a, a relationship among equals. So it was, it was a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And uh, this is exemplified by the visit of four indigenous leaders to the court of Queen Anne. Uh, and they were greeted uh, as the four Indian kings and their portraits were painted by a famous Dutch painter. And, and this really, to me, sort of suggests a high watermark of the nation-to-nation -nation relationship that once existed. And um, while all this was going on, the, the, the French were fighting the English uh, for control of, of this territory. And eventually, uh, the French were defeated and um, indigenous people who were the former allies of the French began to worry that the English would come after them. So this is political science 101, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so there was a, an indigenous chief, uh, Pontiac, who launched a rebellion against the British. He was a former ally of the French. And so this is called Pontiac's Rebellion. He started burning down British forts uh, quite successfully. And this prompted King George III to issue a royal proclamation. So it's called the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Um, most Canadians have never heard of it. And in fact, it's probably the most important historical document that people don't know about. And in the Royal Proclamation, there, there are the words, uh, several nations or tribes of Indians. So here you have the British crown referring to the indigenous people of Turtle Island as nations. These are sovereign nations. They're on equal terms as the British crown. And the most important concept in this royal proclamation is this concept of Aboriginal title. So I'll just take a moment to explain that. Um, so if you own a house, you have a piece of paper that says you have title to the house. Or if you own a car, you have a piece of paper that says you have title to the car. And, and um, there is no piece of paper that indigenous people have that says that they have title to North America, but the Royal Proclamation acknowledges that they have always been here and that they have quote unquote ownership of North America. And the only way to extinguish this ownership 
um, is, is through the treaty process. So the treaty process involves um, what's called in law quid pro quo, so something for something. So indigenous people, they, they give up their ownership of land, and in exchange they get something back from the crown. And I'll explain that uh, in a moment. And this, by the way, is, is, is uh, not ancient history. It's um, reaffirmed in Section 25 of the Canadian Constitution. So this is um, the Royal Proclamation. It's just a one-page uh, document, and the English is sufficiently uh, modern that you can read it and you can understand it. And translated into political geographic terms, what it basically boils down to is this. You have um, a line that in, goes, runs along the, the Appalachian Mountains, and it includes Quebec and, and uh, Newfoundland and a little bit of the coast of Labrador. And everything east of that line, it's been assumed that the Aboriginal title has already been extinguished and surrendered to the British Crown. But everything west of that line, going up to Louisiana, where the Spanish have, have control, all of that is called Indian country. So this isn't a term that the Lone Ranger invented when he was talking to Tonto. This is the actual legal term in 1763. It's Indian country. And the only way to gain control of Indian country is through the treaty process, where indigenous people surrender their Aboriginal title to the crown. I feel like I'm giving a history lecture. Okay, so an Indian treaty is an agreement between two sovereign nations, and we have two kinds of treaties. We have the peace and friendship treaties, and in our introductory remarks, reference was made to the dish with one spoon treaty. That's a peace and friendship treaty. There's uh, two other famous ones, uh, the Turo Wampum Treaty and the Silver Covenant Chain Treaties, and these really set out an ethical standard of, of conduct but the, 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 real, the real treaties that, that have an economic implication, um, these are the formal treaties. And so um, they involve the extinguishment of Aboriginal title. And in exchange for that, Indigenous people receive um, a small annuity, so a very small annual payment. Uh, some communities, they received farm implements. Uh, in Treaty 6, they received something called a medicine chest. We're still trying to figure out what that is. Uh, or another legal term called a usufruct, which is the right to use the land to hunt and to fish, but to not degrade it. And to indigenous people, these were very alien concepts because in indigenous society, you can't own Mother Earth. It's more like Mother Earth owns you. And so um, humanity's role is one of stewardship, looking after the earth rather than just owning it and possessing it. And it's not even clear that they really understood, that indigenous people understood what, what they were signing when they entered into the treaties. But they're, they're sacred and they respect them to this day. Um, and so this was Canada in 1867. Confederation was a process, it was a political process that didn't involve a consultation with indigenous people. It just happened as far as the indigenous world is concerned. The big moment was this Royal Proclamation of 1763. Uh, where it was affirmed that they have uh, title to the land. And, and the way to get from this you know, small little country in the bottom right-hand corner to everything is through the treaty process. And so immediately after um, Confederation, there was a political crisis in, in what later became Manitoba with the Métis. The Métis weren't mentioned in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, interestingly enough, because they didn't exist in 1763. They came around, uh, around 1790. And so Canada, was, um, Canada wanted to build a railroad and was instructed by the British Crown uh, to enter into treaties with the indigenous people. So we have what were called the numbered treaties. And um, Canada literally uh, starved indigenous people, withheld uh, food rations, and coerced them into signing treaties. And um, by the time they got to British Columbia, they basically stopped. Uh, it was around 1876, and they came up with the Indian Act, and this was a different way of dealing with indigenous people. So there are no um, treaties in most of British Columbia, and Aboriginal title is still in force in most of British Columbia. Um, there was a governor at the time, Joseph Trutch, who was a particularly racist individual, and he just refused, he refused to acknowledge the existence of Aboriginal title. And um, 
And that was that. And Canada forgot about it for, for many, many years. So we have, um, this is a map of the numbered treaties. Uh, and it's kind of a parallel universe. And if you ask indigenous people, where are you from? They might say, well, I'm from Treaty 3. Uh, they don't say I'm from Northwestern Ontario. For them, their point of reference is Treaty 3. And um, you, you can see if by looking at the map that parts of Ontario uh, um, didn't even enter into treaties until the 1920s, 1930s. So um, 1876 was a, was a real turning point. This was the, the Indian Act was passed. Again, Indigenous people weren't consulted. They, they just were the recipients of the Indian Act. And it was a brutal piece of legislation. It's not a treaty. It's a bureaucratic tool uh, for basically hitting Indigenous people over the head. And uh, Ottawa determines who is and who isn't a status Indian. This is a very important question because status Indians or Indians have the rights under the treaty. So Ottawa decided, well, we're going we're to figure out who is and who isn't. And they keep a register, uh, which is in existence to this day, of who is and who isn't a status Indian. And indigenous people were basically considered wards of the crown. So legally, they had the rights of children. They didn't have the right to vote in federal elections until 1961, interestingly enough. And if they wanted to vote, then they had to give up their indigenous title or their, their indigenous status story. Um, if they wanted to attend university, they would have to give up their indigenous status um, and uh, on and on. And, and of course, they had no ownership of their homes on reserves. They had no ownership of the land. So there was no way to participate in the economic prosperity of the country because if you want to go to a bank and take out a loan, you know, the first question they ask is, well, what can you pledge as collateral against this loan? And if you don't own anything, you can't take out a loan. Um, I think most importantly is that banned governance, so the way uh, indigenous communities govern their lives, uh, again, these are thousand, thousand year old traditions and they were simply discarded uh, by Ottawa and Ottawa now controls how, how banned councils make decisions. Um, in 1883, uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, I'm going to read this quote, uh, talking about indigenous communities. When a school is on the reserve, the child lives with his parents who are savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training and modes of thought are Indian. He's simply a savage who can read and write. Okay. Now, a lot of people say, give Sir John A. Macdonald some leeway. You know, he was a man of his times. He was an alcoholic. But honestly, this isn't how you're supposed to talk about your treaty partners. Um, the real low point, I think, for indigenous people in, in uh, Turtle Island came around 1885 when there were only 100,000 indigenous people in all of Canada. And so uh, if you think of an original population of, of 2 million people, we've now lost 95% of that original population. It, it was a, a huge, huge uh, loss. And um, in the prairies, Virtually 100% of indigenous people of all ages, including children, were infected with tuberculosis. They lived in abject poverty. Um, most of the buffalo were gone. And it was around this time that Ottawa really stepped up its campaign of forced assimilation through residential schools. And in, in 1904, uh, a graduate of the University of Toronto, um, Peter Henderson Bryce, uh, who was the, one of the founders of public health in Canada, was sent by his boss uh, Duncan Campbell Scott on an inspection of all the residential schools uh, in Western Canada. And he came back with this astounding statistic that 24 to 76 percent of the kids were dying of tuberculosis. It was a massive, massive epidemic. And he made some very simple recommendations. Again, this is before antibiotics, uh, but we knew a little bit about ventilation and hygiene. And, and his recommendations were ignored by Ottawa. And um, his boss, Duncan Campbell Scott, said, uh, it is readily acknowledged that Indian children lose their natural resistance to illness by habituating so closely in these schools and that they die at a much higher rate than in their villages. But this alone does not justify a change in the policy of this department, which is geared towards the final solution to our Indian problem. And those words, the final solution, were spoken you know, a couple of decades before the, the Nazis used similar language of a final solution. And these are words of genocide. 
Um, even after the, the horrors of the, the Nazi uh, uh, concentration camps were known, Canada continued to engage in nutrition experiments on indigenous children in residential schools. And um, these were the early days of nutrition science. And children were placed on special diets, low calorie diets, diets that were deficient in, in particular vitamins. They were denied basic dental care to see if their gums would bleed. And um, the survivors of these experiments, their only memory of residential school was that they were hungry all the time. And they would go out behind the school and they would look, you know, they would rummage through the garbage or they would try to catch small animals. They would just do anything to get extra calories. And, and these memories of intense, persistent hunger are with us even, even today, unfortunately. Um, this is a, a painting that I have. Uh, from a survivor of residential school, and I think it's fair to talk uh, about these children as actual survivors. You know, that, that is not a hysterical term. And he paints this world. It's an upside-down world, right? And so you don't have to be like, I'm a surgeon, so I, I know like this much psychiatry, but I can tell you the reason this school is upside-down is because wrong becomes right, you see. And so physical abuse and mental abuse, things that are normally wrong, they were, they were happening on a daily basis in this school, and it's a world that's just overflowing with tears. I mean, this, this is someone who went back to the original residential school, and by the way, while he was there, he, he didn't even have a name. He was known as number 39. Uh, it just wasn't tattooed on his arm. And he, he couldn't even get out of the car and visit his, his school 30 years later. Like That's how intense this experience was for him. Uh, in the late 1950s, and I, I apologize for this slide, but there were experiments done by an American psychologist uh, where he would take little monkeys and deprive them from maternal contact and there would be um, two, two stations where the monkey could be either you know, on this wire mother where they would get nutrition but nothing else or on a cloth mother that offered no food but at least the opportunity for some physical comfort and, and the monkeys would spend most of the time on the cloth mother because of, of the, the need for contact. And the, the amount of psychological damage that these monkeys um, endured, it, it lasted their entire lifetimes. And this is a model, a scientific model, of basically what happened in, in residential schools. And we knew about this in the 1950s, but we continued with the residential schools until 1996. Um, in, in the 1960s, the survivors of residential school started raising families of their own and they knew very little about parenting because they were never properly parented themselves. So again, parenting isn't something you learn from textbooks or YouTube. You have to have a grandmother who teaches a mother, who teaches a child, you know, how to pick up a child, how to comfort a child, uh, when to let a child cry, when not to let... All of this stuff is learned through direct experience. And so these survivors of residential schools, they had a, a, a terrible challenge parenting their own children. And so social workers would come into the indigenous communities and they would scoop up children and place them with nice white suburban families. And these kids were cut off from their history, from their language, uh, from, from their, their maternal affection. It was, it was a disaster. And uh, in 1985, uh, a judge in Manitoba looked at the whole um, child welfare system, and he used the term cultural genocide to describe what was going on. This is 1985. It's called the Kimmelman Report. And even to this day, I mean, the story continues, even to this day, indigenous kids are 12 times more likely uh, to end up in the child welfare system. So the trauma is truly a multi-generational trauma. Um, in 2008, uh, Stephen Harper offered an official apology it was either that or, or Canada was going to face a massive class action suit from all the residential survivors, uh, residential school survivors. So he offered an official apology. Um, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was, um, was started. And then in, in 2015, the TRC issued its final report. And again, this term cultural genocide came up. And a lot of Canadians heard this for the first time. And they said, what's going on? You know, Canada is a... Is a proud, peace-loving country that flies around the world and we prevent genocides. We 
we were in we're in you know former Yugoslavia or we're in Rwanda fighting, uh, you know. But actually, what what Canada did to, uh, to Indigenous people does meet the criteria of a, of a genocide. Um, same term as, as was used in the in the '60s scoop. So I just want to end with this slide. Um, psychologists use this term secure attachment, and the words don't really explain what it is. Like if you, you know, if you break a dish and you get some crazy glue and you, you, you know, attach the two parts together, they're securely attached. So it doesn't really explain what the human form of secure attachment is. And what it amounts to is that in the pre, uh, prenatal life and the first year of life, there's an opportunity for a child to develop an incredibly strong bond, usually to the mother, but it can be any caregiver, but it's a physical skin-to-skin -skin bond that creates in that child a sense of identity and, and safety that lasts the entire lifetime. And the, um, what happened on, on the left here, you know, you have the, the indigenous mother and she's, she's gazing at her child and this is a, a beautiful child. You can see they're well-nourished, they're happy, they're content, they're contained in, in, inside a Tikkanagan. And, and it's exactly the same love between the indigenous mother and her child as the European mother and her child, of course, because a mother's love is one of those universal constants. And, and basically, Canada set up a system to deny the indigenous child the love of, of their mother and grandmother and extended family. And this has created a multi-generational trauma. Uh, Tom referred to epigenetics, so it's an inherited trauma, we now, you know, this isn't just something that belongs in the field of humanities. There's an actual biological mechanism for this inherited trauma. And the European mother on the right, interestingly enough, has appropriated the, the mothering technology from the savage mother. I'm using that word, word in quotation marks on the left because in my own family, you would have never seen my, my great grandmother walking around the streets of Budapest with a child strapped to her chest. She would have you know, pushed my great-grandmother in a, in a perambulator and given her to a wet nurse. So once again, we've, we've appropriated technology from, uh, and really the spirit of mothering from indigenous families, but we've denied it uh, to their own children. So I think I'm going to uh, stop there with that slide, and um, I apologize if I went over my time limit. Thank you. I think we need to turn down the lights. It's a little bright in here. <laughs> I feel like I can't have a relationship with everyone in here. But I'm going to look at the people in the front row, the friendly faces down there. I'd like to welcome everyone and uh, to thank, uh, thank everyone for inviting me here and to say how grateful I am to be, uh, to be sharing this special day, which is the birthday of my third child. So I just want to say happy birthday to my daughter, Raven, who's sitting in the front, gave up her birthday party to be here tonight. <laughs> so kind of tracing back a few generations, uh, I'm going to just share a little bit of my story as part of the bigger story of uh, Indigenous mental health that I was... Uh, I was honored to accept the invitation to come here and talk about. These are my grandparents. Um, my grandfather was a healer in our community, uh, Gabriel Doctor, and my grandmother, Mary Adele, she had a job too. Uh, she, made, uh, she made clothing, like the mittens she's holding up. And uh, that's a picture of uh, my mother, the grandmother to my children, and, and my father. And uh, that, that's where I came from, and this is, uh, this is where I'm going. This is the future for me, my children. That was when they were young and cute, not when they're old and bratty like they are now. I want to remember them like this. <laughs> 
And I also want to acknowledge in the work that I'm going to share, the ideas and the, 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 the research is, is the research team. And I have a large and dynamic research team of many Indigenous and non-Indigenous students. Um, and, and it's really all of our collective work together in Indigenous communities that, that allows me to be here. So, Massey Cho to, to all of them. So some of you may be wondering um, why we're all here tonight talking about Indigenous mental health. And I want to kind of bring you to think about for a minute why we might want to do that. And, and there's lots of reasons that we could say to do with treaties, to do with history, uh, to do with wrongs, to do with rights. But when I look at what the significance really is um, when, when I go about my job, which is as a researcher primarily and as a clinician secondly, or maybe sometimes it's the other way around, I realize that there's two really big reasons. And one is there are major paradigmatic differences between Indigenous and Western worldviews of overall health, but of mental health specifically. And secondly, there's also a gap in service for Indigenous people in mental health, despite a near crisis of mental health problems in all Indigenous communities. Because in Indigenous communities today, we have a 100% survivorship of abuse of some kind. So here's a, here's a little a snapshot of what some of these differences in worldviews are, and I'm not going to go through them. Um, but I'm going to point out that these, these differences aren't being shared this way to highlight that one's better or worse or um, easier or harder. They're just different, and, and they're like two sides of, of, of a coin or multiple perspectives on one thing. And, and I think the, the differences that are really important for what we want to focus on in terms of mental health and what Indigenous mental health is are really around that in, in the Indigenous worldviews, uh, there's a holistic conception of the world, meaning everything and everyone and all matter is understood as comprising of the spiritual, the emotional, the mental, and the physical has four aspects. So when you hear people say, oh, something needs to be more holistic, what they really mean is that we need to pay attention to all those things. Whereas in the Western paradigm, which is based on individual psychology and uh, philosophy, ontology, epistemology from Western European thinkers, the great, the great thinkers, um, we have something like Descartes' dualism, you know, the mind-body split. There's mind, there's body, there's matter, there's thought. Uh, and, and those two things are really important when we think about what health and mental health is. And the other piece that's really important, I mean, they're all important, is this Western construction of what health is through a disease or deficit lens. And that's what we call the medical model. The medical model is based on a deficit lens of what health is. Health is illness. We know that we're healthy when we don't have symptoms of illness from the Western medical model. Indigenous worldviews of health are based on a wellness focus that use um, ideas that come from things like balance, wellness, uh, relationship. And, and all of these other aspects to these worldviews are all intertwined because when we think about Indigenous wellness, we know that that's tied to relationships, relationships with other people, relationships with the land, which are um, not hierarchical by nature. So, um, so these are some of those differences. And, you know, when we look at the definitions of mental health from these different paradigms, in the Western paradigm, mental health is defined through the DSM, you know, which is the Western health, mental health care Bible, so to speak. It's defined as a state marked by the absence of disease. Indigenous mental health is defined as balance between and within the four aspects or the four sacred aspects of the person, the mental, the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional. <clears throat> 
And one of the first studies that I did um, independently, that was probably around 2001, uh, looked at defining what Indigenous mental health was. And, and I went out and I, I interviewed a bunch of Indigenous uh, counselors and mental health workers uh, in partnership with some First Nations in British Columbia. And they, they really talked about that, in, that Indigenous mental health is defined as holistic. But what, what, what they really meant when I dug a little deeper is what they meant is the missing piece is spirituality in mental health, in the healthcare system. So when workers would say things like, you know, we really need to be more holistic in how we work with people, what they really meant is we need to pay attention to the spiritual in our services and in our programs. So when I think about what these differences are, these, these paradigm differences, these big overarching worldview differences, it really shows me that most of what we know and most of what we practice and most of what we research in the mental health care system comes from this Western deficit disease model lens and doesn't really come at all, despite some of the best efforts and intentions of individuals and some programs, does not come from the strength and solution-based perspective that could really harness the strengths and solutions that individuals and communities have when they bring, when they bring themselves in to try to get help. So I'll give you a quick example of what this looks like in practice. Uh, you know, as, as an Indigenous person uh, who first started doing research in Indigenous mental health around the year 2000, there was nothing out there. There was, there was really very little research uh, or data or anything written. By the kind of early 2000s, uh, models start to emerge. And the first model that emerged in psychology was by a Pueblo psychologist called Eduardo Duran. And he wrote a book called Healing the Soul Wound. And, and in that book, he detailed an approach to working with indigenous people in a Western system that he called hybridism, you know, like the car, the car that, that everyone wants to drive that's better for the environment. Well, I guess uh, hybridism is also better for indigenous people uh, in, the, in the mental health system. And he said that hybridism was really about bringing together the best of indigenous and Western worldviews to serve the needs of the client because all clients and all workers who are working with indigenous clients are in the process of healing from the wound of colonialism and colonization. And that that's part of healing for the individual is that the workers, the doctors, the nurses, the counselors, the psychologists all need to embark on this journey of healing from what he called metaphorically the vampire bite of colonialism. Am I making sense to anyone? Yes. Laugh if, 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 if I do. <laughs> Scream if I don't. So the, the, the second sort of rationale, and I'm not going to get too boring here because we're going to get fun and exciting in a moment, is this gap in service. And, and this is, this is a, a little bit grim, and I don't like to be grim. I like to be, uh, to be fun and happy as much as I can. That's right, fun and happy. And this is really departing um, from the foundational information that Dr. Dan provided us uh, in, the, in the first presentation. And that is really understanding that indigenous people have experienced, I'm getting ahead of myself here, have experienced profound personal aggressions and assaults through colonialism that have negatively impacted their health and mental health. And that's including interrupting the transmission of traditional knowledges related to health and wellness, especially related to mental health. What does this look like? Dr. Dan talked about the Indian Act. And the Indian Act was a law that was created, that was uh, a law and policies that was used to create Canada. Because Canada, as we know, was populated by indigenous people who had their own systems and had their own way of doing things and had towns and villages and those villages got in the way of European settlement. So the government decided to get rid of 
this Indian problem, so that Europeans could come and settle these lands and build their homes and build their towns and build their lives. So part of the Indian Act was really to create all these policies to relocate these people so that they wouldn't be a problem for European settlement. So they got really personal and specific in all of the policies that were designed to eradicate indigenous people through assimilation and through cultural genocide. The legacy of colonization for indigenous people is really what I call and I think others have used this, the indigenous determinants of health. Now you might have heard terms like social determinants of health, and you probably all know what those are. Um, when I talk about the indigenous determinants of health, I'm really talking about how colonization and all of the little things and the big things that happened through the legislated acts enforced on people because of their race have directly impacted what their health and well-being is today. So if I was an indigenous person, for example, um, I would have had a mother and father, because my parents were teenagers when they had me, and they both went to residential school. In fact, that's where they met. Um, and, and as a result of that, I've, I've never been able to be raised by my parents or live with them. I, I never had parents. I had to leave my family when I was very young. And, and I know that if, if my parents hadn't been status Indians who had been shipped off to school and their parents hadn't gone to residential school, that I would have had like nice loving parents and grandparents like people who weren't status Indians at the time. So these indigenous determinants of health lead to things like high rates of death, then not, higher rates of death in non-indigenous people like poisoning, uh, injuries, uh, suicide is another big issue that's really been taken up by the media as a crisis and a huge problem. Um, when we look at individual communities, we don't really know how accurate that is because the media and general society likes to take specific examples and generalize them to whole populations, and we know that that's dangerous. Um, when, we, when we look at suicide, According to the stats, it is a concerning thing, but in reality, we don't really know if these stats are even accurate because our statistics on who are Indigenous people and how many are in Canada are, um, are tenuous for all kinds of reasons due to colonization. I think ultimately what we have to understand about the Indigenous determinants of health is that because of these colonial and racist legal policies, indigenous people have less of what you need to be well and more of what you need to be sick. So when we look at mental health, for instance, this comes out um, in the data as things like higher rates of uh, depression, higher rates of self-harming behavior, higher rates of addictions, higher rates of family violence, uh, sexual abuse, substance abuse, and trauma. That's the big thing that everyone's talking about right now, trauma. And I'm going to talk about that for a minute. But you're going to keep me on track, right? Five minutes. Okay. So what do we know about the indigenous determinants of health? Can, someone, can uh, some people say this out loud? Okay, sorry, I, I didn't hear you. One more time, a little bit louder. Everyone together, let's go. You know, that's the first time my children have ever done something that I asked them to do <laughs> on the first time. Thank you, everyone. That's one thing that I'd like you to take away from today is understanding this idea that, that I'm sharing with you from our work. Because I don't think this is just true for indigenous people. I think this is true for all people. We all have determinants of health that are not just biological, that are not just technical, that are to do with who we are, what we've experienced, what our families are, what our families have been through, and what our future generations are going to experience. 
There's a few other things that I think that we all need to know, and maybe we don't, and that's that there's a two-tiered system of health and education for Indigenous people, thanks to the Indian Act. If Indigenous people live on reserve, their health and education is administered and uh, carried out federally. If they're in cities, towns, rural areas off their reserves, they get the provincial treatment, like everyone else, or so it would seem. But in fact, when Indigenous people are in cities and they're trying to access mental health, or even health care in general, they get into these jurisdictional disputes. If you're Native and you show up at a regular walk-in clinic, you might be told, oh, go down to the Native clinic. Well, what if you don't want to go there? Just because you're Native, you shouldn't have to go to the Native clinic. Um, there's a lot of uh, problems with cross-cultural communication, uh, racism and oppression uh, that Indigenous people face when they're trying to access mental health services. And when people are trying to access these services on reserve, there's a huge problem with quality and control of the health services. And of course, they're heavily underfunded and not represented by Indigenous capacities for healing. I'm probably not going to talk about residential school too much since we already have done that a little bit. And how much time do I have left now? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. So probably most people know what residential school is. But I'm going to give you a quick little lesson here on what it is. And, and we know that it was enacted by um, the Indian Act. It was a policy of the Indian Act designed to exterminate the population through assimilation. And, and the reason that, that the Indian residential schools were created because the federal government sat down and they consulted uh, with each other and with some experts, and they decided that the best way to destroy the family was to take away the children. So they made a law to say, by age five, these children all need to be forcibly removed and put into schools where they're not allowed to be themselves. They have to be someone else. Um, many, many years later, generations later, this was recognized as a harm. And, uh, and, and after, uh, as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's research, um, some facts came out, um, thin facts, because we don't know a lot, because many of the records were buried or destroyed, or the Indian Affairs actually wouldn't release many of its records during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's research, and the TRC actually had to sue the federal government in order to get them to release the documents related to residential school. I'm here to talk about mental health, so let's keep this focused on that mental health implication. And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, because I'm a clinical psychologist, they ask me stuff like, you know, what makes the mental health of, of a Native person different? And I say, well, you know, it's, it's easy. It's residential school. It's foster care. It's intergenerational trauma due to these colonial experiences. And, you know, intergenerational trauma is, is a, lot, a lot about what was talked about um, before I came up here, but it's also about relationships, and it's about how people do or don't build relationships going forward from that site of damage into our most sacred space. And then it just becomes a cycle, not just with the person, but with all the people who touch them, from here to there to there to there to there. And it just keeps going until we can all find a way to address that wound and address that harm that happened, whether it was when you were two, whether it was before you were born, whether it was when you were 16, or whether it was Two nights ago, those wounds accumulate until what happens? <laughs>
you break down. What do we do when we break down? We go back to the community. We go back to the land. And that's what we all need to do to support Indigenous individuals and Indigenous communities and to support ourselves in understanding what it means to practice uh, reconciliation, to understand what indigeneity is. It means we have to start making that space to go beyond the discourse of respecting difference, you know, that uh, cross-cultural stuff that came up in the 80s. We have to go beyond that discourse of, oh, you're you, I'm me, we're different, that's okay. That, that doesn't cut it anymore. We have to make space for Indigenous knowledges to be centered in dealing with Indigenous problems. And, and that really means that the system that's supposedly dealing with healing for indigenous mental health problems from the indigenous, the non-indigenous, the Western worldview of what health is, which is all disease and definite deficits, is going to have to change. So everyone needs to learn. Because if you walk into a hospital, whether it's a mental hospital or a Western hospital, a native person is going to get substandard treatment to a non-indigenous person. I can almost guarantee you that 99% of the time that's going to happen. And it still happens every day. Hospitals, clinics, walk-in clinics, uh, labs, what have you. And that's because people don't know. They're truly ignorant in the true sense of what it means not to know. So apart from understanding that health is a political construct and not just a biological or technical process, I, I, want, I want everyone to just remember that mental health is really about understanding that it's a process of healing. It's not just about what health is. It's about a process of healing from the trauma of colonialism. It's also about understanding that Indigenous models of health can benefit everyone because I think that many of us know that the mental health care system is not just failing Indigenous peoples, it's failing many people. So let's try something different. And lastly, Indigenous health is something that requires reconciliation of colonization on the part of non-Indigenous Canadians and it requires healing on the part of indigenous people who've been wounded. Does that make sense? And we can talk about some of this maybe a little in the panel. So I'm done? Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Carol Hopkins, and I'm the Executive Director of the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation. I come from the Lenape Nation, otherwise known as the Delaware people. And there's only two Delaware communities in all of Canada. We're located along the Thames River um, east, or sorry, southwest of uh, London, Ontario. My father is from the Muncie, Delaware First Nation, and my mother is from the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town, which is where I live. I'm a mother of four adult children, and I'm very blessed to have nine beautiful grandchildren. So I think about them today as well as uh, my teachers that have helped me along the way. I want to talk to you about the strength of Indigenous people. We've heard a lot about the history that has led up to or what we often see in the media and what we often hear about the struggles 
and the issues and the crisis and the problems associated with indigenous people and their communities. And that story has largely shaped society's understanding of indigenous people, the little bit that they do know. To see, that, see indigenous people from a deficit-based perspective and that can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming for anyone in society. It's certainly overwhelming for Indigenous people who have to live that every day. But it sets up a very difficult conversation if all we ever focus on are the deficits and the issues that we face. Because it narrows our perspective and it takes away an understanding about the strengths of Indigenous people. And so this model is difficult to see but you can get more understanding about it at our trade show booth, which is set up in the lobby. And it's a model that was developed in partnership between our organization, the Assembly of First Nations and Health Canada. And it was a national conversation that went on four years to develop this model. And what I want to say to you are two things about this. And one is that in the conversation uh, amongst First Nations people and their partners that they invited um, in various uh, provincial government departments and uh, other partners came to the conclusion that if we're ever really going to make a difference around substance use issues primarily, was this conversation, then things have to change. And first of all, we have to rely on Indigenous knowledge and culture to inform the way that we approach the issues that our people face. And we have to stop thinking about the client as an individual that when we're thinking about supporting Indigenous communities and addressing substance use, then we have to think about the whole of the family and the community because those are central to our values and our worldview as Indigenous people. And when we talk to elders about what could we do, what advice can you give us about changing the way we are addressing substance use issues in Canada for First Nations people? And one of the things that they said is that our approach not only has to be grounded in culture, it has to be spirit-centered. And so on the outside ring, it talks about the principles um, that inform the way that we think about and the way we approach and design services for Indigenous people. That's a very different perspective when you're thinking about substance use issues. And then we, as soon as we finished the Honoring Our Strengths Renewal Framework, we started having a conversation about mental health. And again, another national dialogue. And in that conversation, First Nations people said, we have to stop talking about substance use and mental health as though they exist separately. And we need to start thinking about a whole of a person perspective. And that culture and talking about culture as central to a conversation doesn't go far enough. People don't get it. We need to start our conversations from the foundation of culture from the foundation of indigenous knowledge. And we have to stop talking about it's lost, it's gone. Because our culture is still alive, it's still ever present and it's still accessible. And our knowledge is what is going to propel us towards wellness. And so there's a number of paradigm shifts that are required to think about how we promote wellness amongst indigenous people. This framework is complex, it's comprehensive. It calls upon many partners to participate in supporting wellness amongst indigenous people. But one of the key themes of this framework is that we have to rely on indigenous knowledge and culture. And sometimes, not sometimes, I shouldn't say that, I'm being polite, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> Most of the time, Indigenous knowledge is discounted as a philosophy. That's a nice philosophy for a way of living. It's discounted as something that lives on the periphery of our communities. It's not embedded in our knowledge systems. It's not recognized as credible evidence. And so because of that, it doesn't have a central place in our conversations in terms of government policy, in program design, what gets funded, how we deliver our services, or how we even collect evidence, how we also inform who is the workforce. If culture is the foundation for addressing or for supporting and promoting mental wellness, 
then who are the people that we rely on to help us deliver those services? So this framework says culture is the foundation, calls upon many partners. And it also calls upon us to shift our focus from the narrow focus on deficits to understanding strengths. And if we are thinking about culture and Indigenous knowledge as the foundation, that's a, fa that's a strength-based foundation. Because Indigenous languages were given to us by the Creator. And so we talk about them as a sacred language. In the same way that we understand every being of creation has a sound, that sound is their language. That sound is given by the Creator. Every nation of people that has a different language we understand from our perspective is given by the creator. So it's a sacred sound. And we know from our, our evidence, which is our stories of creation, the creation of the universe, the creation of human beings, our sacred stories that exist across all cultures of indigenous people talk about what it was that was intended for all of life. And our elders say that what was given to us in the very beginning, before there was anything such as time, was given forever in all time. And that what we were given was good life. And so our languages are about living a good life. They're not full of words and descriptions that talk about all of our deficits. So our languages are the foundation of our strength. And in our knowledge systems, we have an understanding of the universe. We have an understanding of the human being. We have an understanding about DNA and about epigenetics. And the proof of that is in our language, in the words that we have. And so in different societies, they talk about the sacred seeds of life that are the DNA. They talk about how the DNA was strung together. They talk about what was absolutely necessary in the environment to facilitate the full expression of the gifts that were given to us in the stringing together of the seeds of life. And we know that from our teachings of creation that life follows patterns. And so that pattern that was created for us as indigenous people is time specific. We existed as a people way before colonization ever happened. And that pattern is still alive and it's still well, and it's still accessible. The pattern of colonization can go on for as long as we allow it to. It can also stop and it can change. And that's the beautiful story about epigenetics, which means that the impact on the expression of our DNA comes from the environment around us and our experiences. But just as it impacts it in a negative way, causes our genes to express themselves or not express themselves, there are ways to impact that. And the most profound way is through our culture. And so I like to use this teaching from the moon who we understand as indigenous people as our grandmother. She's the grandmother because she moves all of the water in all of the universe. She moves the water within us as people. And water is the spirit of life. And we rely on her to help us move life. And so she can help us to move life into the future in a way that is uh, founded and based on and brings forward our strengths. There's lots of evidence that we've been asked to use as indigenous people in our programs and services. We've been asked and required, mandated, to, re to use evidence-based practice. But as uh, Suzanne was talking about earlier, the evidence profoundly is absent of indigenous knowledge. It doesn't include our story. And yet there's an assumption that what works for one population will work for all populations, that if it works for women, it'll work for men, or if it works for men, it'll work for women. If it works for European young people, then somehow it's going to work for indigenous people and indigenous communities. And so the evidence is important. It can be very helpful, but you can't just translate it 
into an indigenous environment. So we have to change that assumption. And we have to examine what is it that blocks us in our institutions, in our governments, in our programs and services, in our individual practice. What is it that blocks us from relying on indigenous knowledge? And some say the current discourse is, well, you can't test it and prove it. So we don't know for sure that it works. There's no evidence behind it. It's not accessible to us. It's not open to question. Those are all examples of statements that haven't been, uh, that haven't had the benefit of a conversation about indigenous knowledge that is accessible, that we can translate into everyday use. None of the elders that I know of and that I work with believe that our sacred knowledge should be just held by individuals for the sake of having sacred knowledge. Every indigenous elder that I work with believes that we should translate that knowledge into everyday use for the benefit of all. And in fact, Elder Jim Dumont talks about indigenous intelligence as doing just that, using knowledge to inform all aspects of our living in a, wise, in a wise way. And our sacred lodges are the source of that sacred knowledge. It's been held in different societies from generation to generation to generation. We have a way of talking about these lodges, that they are firmly planted in the earth. And for indigenous people, they're still accessible. These sacred societies still exist. They still operate. And they still fill life with knowledge about governance, about medicines, psychiatrists, psychologists, so social workers, judges, police. Every profession that a society needs to have is informed by the sacred knowledge held within our sacred societies across this land. And yet we don't draw upon that knowledge. And we've taught through colonization, indigenous communities, that there's no evidence to that, there's no science in it, and it's not credible and we can't use it. And so we continue to fund programs based on theories and models that have not been tested or proven to be effective in indigenous populations. And if we want to create healthy communities, then we have to change the way that we think about who is it that we're serving, who is it that is benefiting. And certainly the individual is important, but we have to move beyond our perspective of creating inputs, individual programs for, to serve individual people with their problems to expand our vision, to go beyond that, to think about outcomes for family and community. So if we do something to help one person, what difference is that going to make for families and communities? And we never think about that in the context of mental health. In the context of mental health, it's the mental health professional and the individual. In our cultural practices that attend to the individual soul wound, it's also within the context of family and community. And so we had a conversation uh, through a research project that looked, used a two world, two eyed seeing approach to look at how do we bring together two world views to understand wellness. And we went from coast to coast and we talked to indigenous knowledge keepers and elders and cultural practitioners and people who work in indigenous communities, people who work in residential treatment to address substance use for indigenous people. And we conducted a scoping review, so we looked at the literature to see what does the literature have to say about measuring the impact of culture in promoting wellness. And as you can imagine, we found very, very little that talked about measuring wellness or measuring the impact of culture. And not one article existed that talked about 
making a difference for the whole person. And so when we talk to indigenous knowledge keepers and we ask them, what is it that creates wellness? They said, you have to attend to the whole person, meaning spirit, emotion, your mind, and your physical being. That all together, they work together. And so we ask them, how do we use culture to, pr to promote this wellness of the whole person? And they said lots of things. But these are the common things that people said across the country, across cultures. They said that if you use culture, that the outcomes that you should expect is an increased sense of hope, that people will have a strong sense of belonging, that they'll know the meaning of life, and that they'll know that their life has purpose. And the way they described how you get there is that if you want to create hope, then you have to invest in the identity of individuals. You have to have a sense of belief that's a worldview. And you have to have an investment and understand indigenous values and invest in those values, for example, family and community. And that if we invest in identity, worldview, or belief, and values, then we create a sense of hope and we give people a grounding. In fact, there's lots of cultural practices that are similar across the country that facilitate this. So for example, when our children were born, not only did we put them in a tick and noggin, but we took their placenta and their umbilical cord and we buried it in the earth so that they would always know where they come from, that they would always have a spiritual sense of belonging, that they would know the land they come from, that the land is their first mother and that all of life comes from our mother, the earth. And that is a grounding in life promotion, suicide prevention. It's grounding for mental wellness. And that if you want to create a sense of belonging, not only is it important to have relationships with people, like your family and your community, but even more important than the people are your relationships with your older relatives and creation and that's the land. So land is not just a location or a place for us to be. It's recognized as our first mother. And land is critically important. And they say that whatever the state of the wellness is of our mother, then that's the state of the wellness of the people. And so a relationship with all of creation and all of our older relatives. So in our stories of creation, people were the last ones on earth. And everything else in the universe and on the earth and above the earth and below the earth were here before us as people. Creation was complete without us. And so we rely on them and we absolutely need them to live life in a good way. And so relationships is inclusive of other than human people. And we think about them as people because our stories talk about creation as having the ability to think, to feel, and to act. And then attitude. Attitude is an attitude towards living life rather than the attitude that nothing in life will ever change and so I have no, no reason or no meaning for living life and then I choose suicide, which is some of the things that Suzanne talked about. We get mental wellness by understanding and an understanding is created from both Cognitive knowledge as well as intuitive knowledge. Intuitive knowledge being our spirit. That when we put the two together, that relationship with creation and learning from creation, also knowing that the spirit of our ancestors live forever and that there's ways that we can facilitate that relationship and maintain it and connect with our ancestors to inform how we live life today. That when we put all of that together, then only then do we have an understanding about the meaning of life and the meaning of our life. And then purpose is created by understanding that indigenous people have a unique way of being in the world. They have a unique way of doing things, taking care of life, living life, taking care of the issues that we have in life. And so we have lots of stories about the bundles that came to us as indigenous people over time because they were necessary. So in our stories of creation, there's no story about the sweat lodge. The sweat lodge came to us as a people 
many, many years later. And there's a whole story about why did the sweat lodge come, when the pipe came to us as people. Many of our different ceremonial articles, there's a story behind them that teach us something about us as people and how to live life in a good way. And those are the very things that continue to sustain us in our mental health towards mental wellness. And so (laughs) we have to learn how to make better mistakes. And I can tell you that the one thing that keeps that roadblock sign permanent on that pavement is our own thinking. The discomfort that we have with ambiguity, the discomfort we have with not knowing, that you can't go to the library and pick up a book to learn about why the sweat lodge came to the people or why the pipe came to the people or what it means to be on the land. You can get some sense of that. There's been something written about it. You might even experience it. But the rights to facilitate that, the rights to conduct those ceremonies, to use those instruments and to teach about them, comes with investment in one's learning. In the same way, a university credentials, psychologists, doctors, We have the same system in our societies for credentialing knowledge, for supervising practice, for for having conversations about what our ancestors did and how do we apply that in this contemporary context. Because the belief is what the creator gave us in the very beginning was given forever and all time. It's up to us as human beings to figure out how do I live with that today different from how my ancestors might have lived it, but bring forward the same principles and teachings. So we have an obligation to create a pathway, and that pathway has to be a conversation about how we bring two worlds together, two worldviews together. And we're involved in a conversation now where we're looking at the language that we have in indigenous science, And how do we align that with our understanding of DNA and epigenetics and microbiota, which is specifically a conversation about what happens at birthing? Because if we want to facilitate wellness, then we have to start before we actually give birth. And what are the the things that we can put into place using indigenous knowledge that should be the the standards for our service delivery across the lifespan? So those are important questions, and they lead to important conversations. But we have to accept that we don't have all the knowledge and that we have to rely on others to bring that forward in a way that is safe, that's not going to be appropriated and misused, and that it's going to be valued if we're going to get to the place of two worldviews existing side by side. And learning uh, cultural humility, which is about knowing, knowing ourselves and our own worldview and our values. And what is it that brings forward, what is it that you can use from that? Rather than just assuming that the unknown is somehow wrong. So moving forward on indigenous mental wellness means working together and working together in a way where you're doing your own learning. Read the Truth and Reconciliation Report. Bother to spend time with those volumes of documents to understand the story of residential school. Colonization and oppression doesn't just exist with residential schools. I can tell you the number of communities where I go and they always talk about the flooding of their land and never being able to go home again because that land is flooded. How they talk about how that changed their communities when they were moved from one location to another location. And so trauma is also about what happened to our relationship with land. And so for indigenous people, in order to move forward, we have to move from this absence of indigenous knowledge to the inclusion of indigenous knowledge. We have to move from this perspective that indigenous people are just 
the sum total of the problems and the crisis that you hear about in the media or maybe even in your practice. And we have to shift our thinking from creating inputs just for individuals to facilitating outcomes of hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose for families and communities. And this uncoordinated, fragmented system of services um, has to move. And actually, I believe that despite the bureaucratic challenges that may, we may face with Minister Philpott going over to be the Minister of Indigenous Services, it certainly offers us more opportunity for influencing policy around those Indigenous determinants of health in a way that will make more sense for us as Indigenous people and allow us to continue to use and bring forward Indigenous knowledge to inform and to create wellness for our people. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for your kindness. While they're coming up here, I forgot about this last quote. Never grow a wishbone where your backbone ought to be. Great, thank you. Uh Thank you for the three, uh, the three of you for those very thought-provoking talks. It gives us a lot to discuss. And just a reminder to the audience that uh, you can tweet us your questions at hashtag OBI talks or send a message to uh, Ontario Brain. And Kirk's monitoring the feed. And I have some questions already, but don't be shy. Uh, if you want to get in on the conversation, we're trying to do it in a modern way and avoiding soliloquies at the microphones. So killing two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. So. Until you guys give me more questions, I'm going to have the, the pleasure of talking with our, our guests. So I want to start, start with Michael. Uh, now, Michael, you gave us a really searing history lesson in a very short time, a lot to think about. Uh, I want, what do we do with all this knowledge now? What, how do we start to react? Is the, the first thing to scrap the Indian Act, or is that too simplistic a, a beginning? So that's a, a really good question. Um, I think I'm hearing two questions. How do we react? And should we scrap the Indian Act? Um, so I'm going to just sidestep the first question for now because I think a lot of people are just absorbing all of this information. And maybe for now that is the best way to react is just absorb it and process it and digest it. But the Indian Act, um, again, I... I feel a little uncomfortable answering that question because it doesn't apply to me. Um, but I, I will say that it's, it's a very complicated question and I think behind that question is the assumption that if we just delete the Indian Act, we're gonna solve all of the problems that were caused by 500 years of colonization and that's really not, uh, you know, it's really not gonna happen. Um, I've, I've met Indigenous people who say, I love living on a reserve. This is my home. Our ancestors are buried here. This is the only place where we truly feel we have sovereignty over our lives. And so it's not a simple question, unfortunately. And, I, and it's one I don't think I can answer, but, but thank you for asking it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Carol, I saw you nodding. Do you want to weigh in on that one? I know it, it's, it's not a simple question, as Michael said. Well, there's uh, many different examples. Uh, for example, self-government uh, agreements between First Nations governments and the federal government um, have been an effort to replace the Indian Act. Um, however, the Indian Act is an administrative tool that exercises um, or is a way to facilitate, facilitate um, more in modern times um, relationship between the federal government and, uh, and First Nations government. And while it's been very oppressive and colonizing, outlawed our ceremonies, our practices, our language, took away our children, our lands, um, it's had and it continues to have significant impact. Uh, 
It also is a vehicle for uh, facilitating an understanding about our rights. And until the rights of Indigenous people are clearly um, understood in a relationship between uh, the Crown and Indigenous people, I shouldn't even say the federal government, it's the Crown relationship um, that the federal government um, administers through uh, what the Indian Act articulates, um, then the Indian Act can't just go away. It, uh, thank goodness the Indian agent did. <laughs> We've replaced the Indian agent in our communities, which was the one white man who dominated all decisions and governed our communities. Um, so that, thank goodness, has changed. Um, and it's true that you know, there's still a long ways to go, but it's not as simple as just saying, abolish the Indian Act. I'm hearing it depends what we replace it with. That's right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so Suzanne, I want to talk a bit about, you know, you talked about the intergenerational trauma, et cetera. It's sort of, a, I'll start with a large question again that I gave Michael. Where, where do we begin with all this? How do you help communities and the entire nations heal after generations of, of suffering and abuse, et cetera? Well, that is a, a pretty, pretty big question. Um, and um, I, I, I don't think there's, there's a simple answer to that, but I think there's... A, different places you can start and, and I think that is first of all um, by stopping uh, the harms that continue to be perpetrated on Indigenous peoples uh, through the mental health care system for example and, um, and, and, and that was talked about throughout all of our presentations I think and I think the easiest way to, to identify and understand what that would look like would be to uh, stop using non-Indigenous forms of healing with Indigenous peoples. Uh, because when we continue to use uh, non-Indigenous forms of healing uh, to help Indigenous people heal, we're actually perpetuating that trauma by delegitimizing Indigenous knowledges and values and ways of life, and by continuing to tell people the only way to get better is by 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 not following your culture and your spirit and your identity. And bring that down to an individual level for me. Uh, put on your clinician hat. How, how do you integrate this indigenous knowledge into your practice to help people who, you know, we've heard uh, have suffered so much trauma that it's even changing their DNA. How, how do you start with the individual as opposed to the community? I can give an example. Okay, let me say one thing sure. first though. So, you know, I, I've received a lot of different teachings. You know, I'm, I'm a psychologist. I got a lot of Western teaching, but I also got a lot of spiritual and traditional teachings. And one of the teachers, many teachers that I've worked with continually tell me we're all spiritual beings having a human experience, um, which, is, which is a real indigenous worldview in terms of what life is and what healing is. And when we, we break that down to the individual, you're saying, you know, oh, you're a clinician now. Well, I, I'm, I'm never just the clinician or just the researcher or just the policy person. I'm all those people at the same time. And who I am in all those people, in, in all those identities that I work from is a spiritual person. And working from that spiritual framework and that spiritual place is where the healing begins. Yeah, jump in there. Uh, another example is um, about adolescence. And so earlier I was saying that we had cultural practices that were critically important at every stage of life. And those cultural practices were focused on the health of the spirit. And so at the adolescent stage of life, um, a Q and any Peter Ochis uh, used to talk, I say used to talk about that because he's deceased now, um, and, and many elders still talk about this, but the teaching is about, it was, it was called the fast stage of life. And it was called the fast stage of life because at the adolescent stage of life, there's so many things that are going on, but mostly it's about instant gratification because the prefrontal cortex, our brain is still developing and we don't have the ability for critical decision making. It's in development. And for indigenous people, we had an understanding of that. And so that fast stage of life 
meant that there was an understanding that in this physical world, that's our experience. And so you take care of it spiritually by fasting. And so fasting was going without the sacred medicines of life. So, for example, relationships with people, um, food and water, fire. Those are examples of the medicines that we absolutely need to live, uh, to live life. And so at the adolescent stage of life, there was a lot of work that went into fasting over those medicines. And for young girls, when they first started their menstruation cycle and they first became a woman, it was a, it's a very, very sacred time. And so there was, and there still is, ceremonial practice that goes over a year period of time that is investing in teaching her about delayed gratification. And I'm just talking about young girls, but there are practices for boys as well. So for example, um, we know in our teachings that the berry, and specifically the strawberry, is the chief of all foods. There's no other food that comes from creation before the strawberry. And so it's the chief. And then all of the other berries come in their season. And so they're medicine. And it's important to always pray over that medicine as the chief of all foods. And that if we were ever to stop doing that, they say, then that would be the beginning of the end of our food cycle. And so there are still young women today that when they first become a woman, they'll pick all of the berries, they pray over them, but they don't eat them. They preserve them. So any of you who have fresh berries in your house and you're preparing them maybe for a pie or to can them, you know how strong and how sweet the smell is. And so those young girls will prepare them in that way and resist the temptation to eat those berries or to even sneak a taste because they have a belief that putting away that medicine and fasting over it can benefit all of the people, but even more than that, all of creation. And so that's delayed gratification, which is a skill that is required for a longer term payoff in terms of helping our brain to develop those critical thinking skills. So while our brain is in the development of these critical thinking skills, it doesn't just magically happen that when you turn 24 years old, all of a sudden you can make the best decisions in the world. You need help. You need help in the way that you're parented. You need help in the way that you connect with creation. You need help in the way you understand the world. And so that's just one example of what we did naturally to facilitate that good, develop, good brain development. And so if we're thinking about um, community-based mental wellness services, that's a community-based mental wellness service. But it doesn't get funded as a mental wellness program. The elders and the grandmothers who facilitate that process don't get paid like the psychologist or the social worker to do that. Um, and it happens outside of for, for formal programs and services, but it still does do happen. Um, and for young men, they, they fasted as well, and there was a specific marker in time when they fasted, and there were certain teachings about that. But at that adolescent stage of life, there was an understanding about the developing brain and what was necessary to take care of both their spirit and their physical life. Yeah. Now, Michael, I want to ask you, you've invested as a, a philanthropist in educational programs and Indigenous uh, issues and research. Tell us why that's important to do today. Uh, is it part of reconciliation? Is it something larger than that? And a bit, how do you integrate the cultural practices into the research and the teachings? Uh, um, okay, I'm, I'm hearing you ask about why I invested. So, yeah. <laughs> how much time do I have for an answer? <laughs> I, the quick answer is, and, and I'm going to jump around a bit here. So. So bear with me. But well, you gave us a few hundred uh, years and 15 minutes. So okay. I'm sure you can be yeah. <laughs> So <First. laughs> prior to contact, about 2 million Indigenous people. Today, 1.5 million Indigenous people. So clearly, settler colonialism is a total failure when it comes to eradicating Indigenous people from Turtle Island. Like, 
They're still here. Okay. Fantastic. They're, 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 it's, it's a virtually indestructible culture. Now, 5% of the Canadian society, right? 25% of the federal prison population. This might sound a bit politically incorrect, but I have yet to, to hear someone do the math and, and just explain, you know, this is, these are terms that, that Western people understand, how expensive it is to have indigenous people in this state of perpetual trauma, crisis, unwellness. It's, it's costing taxpayers a huge amount of money. And when indigenous cultures contain the, the, the very medicine for their own healing, then we have to you know, let the genie out of the bottle. I'm, I'm mixing metaphors here, but let that healing occur and, and see you know, it's to the benefit of everyone. And, mm -hmm. and these cultures that have been around for, for 10,000 years, I have nothing but awe and respect for them that they have. You know, this is the first time I've heard this strawberry teaching. It's absolutely, I'm going to go home and you know, I've got teenagers <laughs> or soon to be teenagers. And, Again, it's brain developments, delayed grant, that's exactly what, what they need. So this is just another example of how in indigenous knowledge can benefit everyone. So that, that, that's really the motivation for the philanthropy is because in the, in the end, the, the status quo is, is unsustainable. It's incredibly expensive. So Suzanne, I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, I want to get to some audience questions because I don't know we we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to throw this one right at you that I was just handed. So how can healthcare providers, and you're a provider uh, among other things, how can you incorporate reconciliation into your practice? Well, I service most Indigenous people for free. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Well, I'm actually not kidding. That's, that's not that's really a joke. Um, or I have to service them at a substandard fee because uh, Indian Affairs will only pay a certain amount relative to what other people will pay for the same service. Um, how do I... Well, you know, for me, reconciliation on a personal level is about healing from my own wounds. Uh, that, that, that have happened as a result of colonialism. And I, I have a lot of wounds um, because of what's happened to me, to my family. Um, that's my job in reconciliation, my personal job, mm -hmm. is to heal myself, uh, to be responsible for my own healing. As, uh, as a member of the healthcare system, as a researcher in a university, um, my actions toward reconciliation are really about uh, using whatever bits of courage that I have left after trying to survive the life that I've had to make it safe for Indigenous students to learn, to fight tooth and nail every day to justify my identity uh, and my worldview in the place where it's not really welcomed, so that our traditional knowledge keepers, our healers, our elders can come and share what they're meant to share with all the rest of us. And Carol, uh, another question that was just handed to me, They're asking how can mainstream mental health institutions and initiatives, how can they adopt uh, indigenous models and, and blend them in and promote wellness, not just ment you know, dealing with mental illness, the whole mm -hmm. wellness portion of it? Well, I think a good start is as to, um, you, even at an individual practitioner or organizational level is to invest in cultural humility, which is first understand your own worldview and the models and the values behind those models and the theories that 
you subscribe to in facilitating um, an answer to mental health. Um, so that's the first thing. For a long time, um, we've invested in these exercises of cross-cultural education, meaning I'll tell you all about the different ways that we behave, and the assumption is that the listener will then know how to interact with us appropriately as Indigenous people. And in fact, that doesn't usually work because the participant doesn't bother to do their own self-reflection and to say, well, that's right, I do practice from a disease model that only looks at the individual, and they're talking about family and community. Like, what does that mean anyways? Am I supposed to bring in the whole family, and how do I deal with the whole community? What does community development mean? Like, those conversations are good conversations because they're conversations that we don't typically have. So invest in cultural humility. That's for yourself. Then secondly, understand what is cultural competency. And, and that means understand the history of colonization. Understand trauma is different than intergenerational trauma. Stop blaming indigenous people uh, for the issues that they're facing and understand them as issues of colonization. And then look at what are the policies of your organization that facilitate a relationship with indigenous people. And when I say indigenous people, I mean with the community that exists in Toronto, there's certainly an indigenous community. Um, there are reserve communities, First Nations communities that are important to have conversations um, with so that you can start to collaborate on how you might be able to meet the needs of Indigenous people. And so practitioner, organization, collaboration with community, and then once you have a good relationship with Indigenous people, then start having a conversation about how you bring Indigenous practices and knowledge into um, a mainstream, if you will, uh, mental health service or how the mainstream mental health service might partner to offer services on the reserve in a way that's meaningful for Indigenous people. Great. So we're almost out of time, but almost all the questions I got asked included questions about reconciliation. Uh, people are struggling with what they can do. So mm -hmm. I thought we could send them home each with a maybe some homework or some tips on, on what they could do. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, read the TRC report. Right. But I, I want to ask each of you briefly, what's the one thing someone, a non-Indigenous person or an Indigenous person can do to, to help resolve this trauma and this historical problem we have? Uh, Michael, uh, so, I know you love these big questions. <laughs> uh, so I, rec I recommend reading the book For Joshua by Richard Wagamese. Yeah, great book. Great. Suzanne? Do I get one answer or five No, answers? of course not. <laughs> you have many hats, so you can have a few. Um, well, if I'm wearing my mom hat, I would just start yelling. But I'm <laughs> not going to do that. Uh, I'm just kidding. Not really. Um, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think part of what people can do individually for reconciliation is has already been done and that was by choosing to come here tonight to mm -hmm. educate yourselves. Every person needs to educate themselves about the history of Canada and how they have either benefited or been harmed by the creation of Canada and what it means to you personally. It doesn't matter whether you came here last week or you came here last year, or you came here five generations ago, or you've been here since time immemorial, what's your position in our colonial construction of where we're living? And how does what you do as a person, either in your job or your personal life, either continue to perpetuate colonialism or work towards reconciling it? Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, that's what you hired me to do, come up with great answers, right? And Carol will give you the final word. I would say that the one thing that anyone can do that doesn't cost them anything is to see Indigenous people with strengths, to see their strengths. So when you leave here and you see the homeless man on the streets, think about the strength that it takes to live on the streets. 
that he must have suffered intergenerational trauma and yet he's still surviving. How does he do that? He does it with strength. When you hear about the crisis in communities, don't think about those communities as absent and void of any strengths. Realize that they have tremendous strengths. And that's how they continue to survive despite all the suicides that they face from generation to generation. Understand that there's been systemic racism and colonization that has impacted their ability to take care of their children. Understand that Indigenous people have strengths. And when you see Indigenous people or you hear stories about Indigenous people, pay attention to your own thinking and what's the first thought that comes to your mind. And challenge yourself to think about the strengths that must be, that must be there and that are there. And, and then have conversations about that with people. And I think you know, each one of us um, can make a difference in this world and that's, and that's how we do it, is with conversation. Great. Well, thanks for ending on a... a go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was, gonna, yeah. I was just going to add one more thing. Oh, you could go to the Imaginative Film, Imaginative Film Festival that's coming up in October. Great. So I wanted to thank the panelists for a wonderful discussion, uh, for ending on a positive note. Uh, Elder Dorothy Peters is going to come back up and uh, close the evening. And while she's doing so, please give a, a huge hand to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.